So this morning we have the privilege of working through the Asret HaDevrim, the ten living words of our Father, the, the words that He has spoken from His glorified manifest presence to a nation. And as we were standing here this morning and we sang these songs, I was wondering, we are so, Father, you are here in our midst. Touch our hearts. So the challenge is, is that what Israel experienced. As Israel was standing in, before a mountain where our Father's manifest presence was shown to them, and he invited them to come closer, yet they turned around and stood further. And this is our challenge this morning, is how much are we willing, really, and how prepared are we to stand in His presence? This, this, is our, this is our challenge. So, this today is from Exodus 18 until 2023, and it's really the setting of a wedding scene. This is a wedding that is about to take place in, um, between our Father and Israel. And it all, always strikes me, have you, who's been to marriage ceremonies before? Who's been, okay, let me ask, rephrase, who's married? You have to have been to a marriage ceremony before. Who is the guy that's usually made fun of? Who is the guy that's, uh, you like my sister's by us, who's done cook, so who not? Remember that story? Who's the guy? The bridegroom. I wonder why, why is that? If a marriage ceremony before the king is supposed to resemble our relationship with him, why is it that you are making fun of the bridegroom when he is the one that shows himself to Israel? I think we've got it a little bit wrong. There's something wrong in that story. So remember, as we are showing ourselves before the Father and we are coming close to Him and live a life before Him, it is um, a choice that we exercise in our lives to draw closer to the Father and ask Him to restore us, to bring us back to His Tselem and Demut, His image and likeness. That's what we are saying. Father, here we are. We present ourselves before You. We know we are broken vessels. You restore us. How does that work? What is the pattern that the Father uses to do that? First, He shows us His goodness and His mercy and His glory, and we make the choice to walk with Him. And then He shows us the ways of righteousness, His ways, His loving ways. And then we choose to follow Him and be obedient to love Him, obey Him, and cling to Him. That's what we do. But the, this, the path includes testing. This is the way it goes. Uh, remember what uh, Hebrews 12 says? It says, if you are not tested, if you are not chastised, you are not a son. You are legitimate. So we need to know this is the way that we are called to walk, is to lay down our own lives and pick up the life of the Father. So what I, what I would like us to do is to stand up. Because we are going to read the ten words together, and I feel as... The Father has given us these words from His glorified presence. It is fitting to stand in honor of our Father and our King. So I'm going to read it and you can follow. I am Yote Bafei, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrahim, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of that which is in heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yotevafe, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not bring the name of Yotevafe, your Elohim, to naught. For Yahweh does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yotevafe, your Elohim. 
You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days your Tehuafe has made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. And therefore your Tehuafe blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Respect your father and your mother, so that your days will prolong upon the soil which Adonai Elohim has given you. You do not murder, you do not commit adultery, you do not steal, you do not bear false witness against your neighbors, you do not covet your neighbor's house, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. To your neighbor. Thank you. We can sit. These are the words that have been spoken to Israel. And how did, the question is, how did they respond to the hearing of these words? We'll speak about that a little bit. So the background to this story is a nation that is now being formed out of slavery. They have been spending some time in Egypt, and I think uh, to a large extent, we've discussed this before, they've lost their identity. They don't know who's their father or their mother. They have lost their, their link to our father. Remember, it said to, uh, our father said to Moses, by the name Yotevave, I was not known to them. Because they lost the relational aspect of their they're functioning in our father's midst. So that's the first thing. It's a nation formed out of slavery. Then they come from a pagan culture and they have replaced the image and the likeness that our father has planned for us as a nation with patterns and images and things that they've seen in the nation of Egypt. And now there's a time of restoration. There are restoration must, must need to take place. And uh, I think the things that we can see in our own lives and the things that um, they had to deal with is a certain mindset. Fear is part of their experience. They've got certain values that needs to be changed. They've got a mindset that um, comes from a perspective of a slave to the world and not out of a son of our father. And uh, as we saw in Egypt... Compassion wasn't the first quality that Egypt sort of shown to Israel. And Israel has grown up with this. And if compassion is not part of your life and your makeup and your DNA, it needs to change. And it happens through a series of events and testing and proving. And this is what the Father is doing to us. So what I said is, what is Israel's identity look at the moment? What does it look like? Romans 12, 2 gives us an indication of what it should look like. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Remember living in Egypt? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of our Father. Let the love, let love be without hypocrisy. Shrink from what is wicked and cling to what is good. In brotherly love, tenderly loving towards one another in appreciation, giving preference to one another, not idle in duty, ardent in spirit, serving the master, rejoicing the expectancy, enduring under pressure, continuing steadfastly in prayer, imparting to the needs of the set-apart ones and pursuing kindness towards strangers. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. It, it goes on to say, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be proud in mind, but go along with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Repay no evil for evil and respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, on your part. Be at peace with all men. They say, if possible, then, I see. Beloved, do not revenge yourself, but give place to the wrath, for it has been written, Vengeance is mine, and I shall repay, says Adonai. Instead, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head, and do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Is this the mindset of Egypt, of Israel that just came out of Egypt at the moment? This is a challenge, this mindset, these values is a challenge to us. We've been living and worshipping our Father for a long time and growing in His, in His ways and embracing whatever He's been telling us what to do, but if we are challenged on these points, they're a problem to us in many ways. So I think we definitely see that people that's coming out of Egypt, they need to be transformed. They need to be restored. And as it is the Father's intention and his, and his strategy with the people of Israel and with us on its way forward, it involves setting our, resetting our course, realigning our course to His. And then if we are walked some ways, what, is, what does He do to make sure that everything is good? He tests us. That was a test, by the way, to know if you know the answer. So, He tests us. So... We will see this working in the life of Israel on every, on every place that they put their foot, their feet. So, the thing is, with Israel, with them starting to engage and to walk in these ways, um, there are certain things that need to take place in their lives. And this week we are seeing one of the biggest events in their lives, and that's the giving of the word, the giving of the Torah, the, or not the Torah, the ten living words that the Father has, has been speaking to them. But the first thing that we must make a decision on, and we will speak about some thresholds that needs to be crossed in a future talk about two weeks from now, I think. But um, the first thing that we must make a choice is, do we really want to be in the presence of Adonai? Do we want to meet him in his glorified presence, is Do we? It's a little bit of a scary answer, you know? It is not as easy as we think, because remember he says, the one that sees my face will certainly die. Why is that the case? Why does that, why is that so? Because we need to be restored. The Father is busy with us in a process in which He builds us and He restores His, His uh, image and His likeness in our lives up to the point where we are a bride without spot, wrinkle and blemish. So, I think the words that, um, the words that Moses has received, and I'm just thinking of it, is remember the burning bush when Adonai spoke to him the first time? It was, a, it was words coming out of the object of fire. It was from a burning bush. It is, they are now confronted at the mountain with the Father coming down in all of His glory and words coming from fire. Where else do we see fire? I'm thinking about, what about in Acts 2? About the apostles that had to flame the tongues of fire on their heads and they spoke the words of our Father. But there are other guys too. Daniel. What about Daniel's friends? Salsak, Milsak, and Apleenwag. Daimana. What did they do? They, they chose to be obedient, to love our Father, to be obedient, and to cling to Him with everything that they have. And they went into the fire. They made the right choice to uphold the glory and the, the words and the relationship with our Father. And they went through a gate making a choice for our Father and, him, and they were met and taken care of in the fire. So we must remember it is, if we make this choice to walk towards our Father, it is His consequences. And what is the desired result or consequences of coming closer to Him? Is to have our personalities, our characters transformed into the image of the Son. That's what we are going for. It's, it's not always... I'm looking for the right word. It's not easy to do. I was thinking of words like pleasant and uncomfortable. But, uh, but all of those, it is pleasant to draw closer to the Father. It is wonderful to draw close, but there's consequences. We will be changed. Because um, as these guys were brought closer to our Father's presence... 
and seeing him face to face, there will come a day where we will see our Father face to face. And what will we do? Will we shrink away or will we run towards him? It's easy to say now. You know, it's easy to say, yes, of course, I'll put my arms around him. It's a scary thing to be in the presence of the set-apart father. So, the question is, and in today's story is, will Israel listen to my voice? Will they listen to my voice? Uh, Christian had a talk last week that spoke about the heart of the father. The heart of the father is to reveal himself to us so that we will draw and run to him and love him, obey him and cling to him. Those three things. Remember, in that order is necessary. And we can see it happening in these words. But before we get there, there are certain things that happen in our lives. We are purged, we are cleaned, and we are tested through fire. On a hot day like today, it's, you know, we can associate with that a bit. So, we, you know what I thought? Exodus 15. The song of Moses. When they came through the sea, the enemy has been dealt with. Israel is in the perfect place in the presence of our Father. This is their testimony. And Exodus 15, the song of Moses, and in Revelation, the song of the Lamb, are knitted together. And this is the song of victory that we will sing in the presence of the Father. That's where we must be. The song of Moses, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And this is where we are heading. But now, before we get to the end point, we need to be changed. And this is what Israel is going through. And this is the calling that the Father has put on our lives, is to align our lives with His. So what is the ten words about, before we get to the setting? What is, what is the implication? What is the inv why the invitation to import the ten words into our lives? Why is it even necessary? Is it a checklist to do so that we can make our Father happy, so that we can live a life in His presence, and you see we act according to a new morality that's given to us, to Israel, we act according to His ways, and now our Father is happy and glad? I don't think so. We'll get to that. So, just as a little bit of a backdrop, Israel now came out of Egypt, and remember the night before the redemption, Moses said to them, go into the Egyptians, to your neighbor. Remember, you're your friends. And go and ask them, speak to them, and they will give you the objects that you are going to use for worship. The silver and the gold and the purple and scarlet fabrics. And you will take it into the wilderness, not to trade with, primarily, but as substance for worship. That's why you have it. So... From Egypt, the means of worship has been restored. They've been redeemed on Aviv the 14th. They've been delivered on Aviv the 15th. They were confronted at the Red Sea. By the way, the confrontation at the Red Sea was for the purpose of testing Israel, whether they will listen and go forward. When everything points the other way, will they go forward and listen to my voice? Then they sang the song of Moses, which was a victory song, and where, where um, their newfound relationship with our Father was celebrated. When they became hungry and their own means of, of uh, sustenance were gone, they ate the manna and they tasted the sweet waters of Marah, eventually. Because the, t the place of Marah was a place of testing. And the evidence of a tree, of an etz, that was thrown into the water, turned this bitter water into sweet water, so that we can have a prophetic foreshadowing of what Messiah will do for us. They battled Amalek with, our, with Moses' arms held up high as a, as a sign of, his, of their dependence on our Father, and they were now spending time at Sinai being washed and prepared to receive and to be present, present in the presence of our Father at Sinai. And now, we've got a meeting with the Creator. This is where we're at. Now think of this. We're coming out of Egypt land, and we were introduced to idolatry for hundreds of years. 
And we, are, we have seen the wonders and the glory of our Father in Egypt. Even through the Red Sea, when we have manna, we have water flowing from a rock. And we've got an expectation of what it is going to be. What is our expectation? What does it look like? What do we have in our minds and in our hearts of what it will be like to meet our Father? They had an expectation too, you know? So, I think if we, if we look at the ten words, and this is what, where we are going to go today, which all we're doing is looking at the ten words, but we, look, we are going to look at it from the context of the Exodus story. And the context of the Exodus story is to bring a nation, a family, out of Egypt and to show the heart of the Father to this nation so that they can be restored and rebuilt and that they can be the image bearers of the Father for the time forward, to be a light unto the nations and to bring the world unto the knowledge and the goodness of our Father. That's the context. It can be a list of do's and don'ts, you know, 613 laws, there's many green, you must do, you shouldn't do, you know, it gets confusing sometimes. And, um, but when we work through those items and through those statutes and ordinances and everything else, the final, the bottom, the foundation of it is so that the Father can show his heart towards us and so that we can grow in his image and likeness. Deuteronomy 20, uh, 30, 20 says, the purpose of what we are doing is to love our Father to obey his voice and to cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, to dwell in the land which he swore to our fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give it to them. So if we can acknowledge and proclaim that he is our life and the dwelling of the land, where are we dwelling? In which land are we talking about? What, where are we hidden? To the promised land. We are heading to the promised land. They were heading to the promised land of Israel, which is a type and a format of the garden from which Adam came. Remember, so we are being restored and we will be restored in our lives back into the garden, the garden which we are going to walk with our Father. That is is where we are going. So we need to know his heart and his life and his relationship with us. So... Where we are going is not to accept this as a list of do's and don'ts, but we are aiming for change hearts, enabling us, us here, to show our Father's heart, His compassion, His values, so that we can become the 1 Peter 2.9, the priest to the nations. We can be the a priesthood, a royal priesthood to the nations. That's what he, the, the aim for our lives. But we need to work through a couple of things in our lives before we can get there. So the commandments, if we look through them, the first three we know is the worship, uh, the worship and honor to our Father. What, is the, what are the first, first three commandments? Can you remember? I am the one that brought you out of Egypt. Believe in me. Remember, that's the first one. What is the second one? Idolatry. You will, you will make no image and have any idols before me. What's the third one? Do not take my name in vain. So they're all to do with the honor and the worship to our Father. So as we, but how does it portray unto us? How, what effect does it have in our lives? If we can live through those three, first three, have faith in Him and look at the idolatry, take that away out of our lives and we cannot use his name in vain, that will put us in a place where our testimony to one another is positive and we will have a testimony of the heart and the love that the Father has put in our lives. The number four is the Shabbat, and it is about our mutual confession as a community. So as we draw close to the Father here as a community, we can bless and encourage one another and we can speak of his goodness and his love and his mercy that he has shown through, to us through the week. And this is remembering. What are we remembering? His goodness and his mercy and his creation and his resting. All the aspects that we have read so far. That's what we know. Number five on the parents is really what 
the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments is hinging on. That's the middle one, the one that everything hinges on. The only one with a promise. The promise is so that your days may be lengthened in the land. Remember the first promise to Adam? It was said to Adam, if you eat of the tree of, the, of life, you will live a long life. In fact, immortality will be yours. Where will they live? In the garden. Honor your parents so that your days may be lengthened in the land that the Father gives you. This is a carrying on of that promise. So if we honor the people that the Father has put in our lives to bless us, and you honor them, they may not always be right, that's where forgiveness come in, and love and compassion, but if we honor them, there is something that we, are can, we can look forward to. And 6.10 is to show our love to others as his children, so that we can have a, a confession of his goodness towards one another. Because if we, if we take anything that's in there, if we take it away, it is diminishing the image that the Father has put in in my life. And I cannot live out the testimony of his goodness to you. But we'll speak in a little bit detail of that a bit further on. So, so it starts out, the Ten Commandments starts out with honoring our Heavenly Father. One, two, three. Really, one, two, three, four. But it is to honor our Heavenly Father. And then from five on forward, it is the responsibility that we have been placed in our lives as His image bearers. And to honor my neighbor, the one that bears His image next to me, so that we as a community can walk on forward. Because remember, Pesach starts with an individual acknowledgement of, the, of my trust in my faith that I place in Him because I put the, the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost of my heart. But as we said before, that was not the blood of the covenant from Egypt. When was the blood of the covenant uh, celebrated when they came out of Egypt? In Exodus 24 verse 8. When Moses sprinkled the blood on the, on the book of the covenant, the scroll of the covenant, and on the people. So, we are to declare His goodness and His mercy and to become the image bearers that He has for us. So, that was the good news. The better news is, is that uh, our Father will test us, for sure. And He tests His covenant partners to determine one thing. Is will we live according to our own decisions and our own wisdom, or are we going to to apply and to live in His wisdom? And we, and this is a life of choices. But the more you choose to walk in a direction, the easier it is to walk in that direction. So He wants us to uh, to adapt to a lifestyle that resembles Him. And this is why we've got a structure in what it means to become someone that worships our Father. So, from the very first couple that were placed on the earth, Adam and Chava, there were two choices set before him. Eat of the tree of life, and you'll live a long life in the land. Eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and you'll die. So why the heck do you think that they make that choice? You know what, we are, tests are, we are, every day we are presented with tests. But there are two forms of tests. The one is a test, and the one is a trap. And we've got to have the discernment in which is which. How do we discern the difference between those two? We've got to have a relationship with a tester. If the one, if the test that we are going into, and you know the tester, this appears to purge us and to have, to, to he's got our the goodness. His goodness is is what he has in his heart for us. If we can discern that, it's a test. But if we engage in something which we know the word doesn't support, and he says this is a shortcut to a blessing, it's a trap, and you should avoid it at all cost. So how do we discern the difference? We've got to know the Father's character. And if we can discern from the character that displayed in this word, whether this is leading us towards goodness or this is going to lead towards death, we need to make that choice. 
And sometimes we make the wrong choices. Israel has made wrong choices, and we've got the, the example of Israel making wrong choices all over, right through the Tanakh. Every choice that they made eventually failed. Until, until there came one man on the earth. And Yeshua was tested in Matthew 4, in the wilderness, and the enemy put two doors in front of him, or a door in front of him. And every time he was presented with a temptation of authority, of food, of all the things that we are tempted with, he turned away from the door, quoted the word, and he walked through the door of life. Eventually into, I think it's Matthew 26, where he's presented in Gethsemane, in, uh, Gethsemane where he says to his Talmudim, his disciples, come and pray with me, because this is the hour of testing. The final great test is before me. And he says, Father, let this cup, no? this cup is a heavy cup to bear, but let, I will accept your way. I will accept this and walk through the door of testing when you call me to. And because he did, because he passed the tests, he was glorified and sat at the right hand of Elohim. And when we have a failure in our life, when we, go, when we walk through the wrong door, we can reach out to our Father through Messiah and ask for forgiveness and we will be restored and we can choose life in any case, in any direct ways. So, James says though, James has a perspective on this. One verse two almost says, count it all joy when you're tested. Brethren, when these things come upon your life, count it joy. Why? Because it's an opportunity to be transformed in the image of the Son. The one who passed all the tests on our behalf. Because in Him we are proclaimed to be innocent. Although we make mistakes, we can go back and ask for forgiveness and be restored. Okay, so this is the good thing. James says, if you are tested, it is the result of you growing in our walk with our Father, and when we have walked some ways, He will test you to see if you've learned anything. This is just the way it works. So it's a joy when we are tested, because we know we are making progress in our relationship to our Father. So, Exodus 19 is Moses is instructed by our Father. He's an 80-year-old man, Who's 80 years old, more or less, here? Yeah? Oh, let's not expose. An 80-year-old man climbs the mountain seven times to the top of the mountain. He's called. This time, the father says to him, Moses, come up here. Come up hither is the right word. So he comes up the mountain and he says, go down and says to Aaron, we must come up with you. You know? Moses does that every time. He obeys. He's, it's a pleasure for him to do so. Verse 17 says, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim after he's been instructed what to do. What did they do before this? Is a father said to Moses, Prepare to meet me. Let them wash for two, or three day, two, two days. On the third day, I will present myself to them. Build a boundary of stones around the mountain because no one is to go through the boundary because he will be shot with arrows. Why do you think this is the case? Sounds harsh. Here is our loving Elohim standing before us in his glorified presence. We are not allowed to pursue any further than the boundary. We need to work through things in our lives so that we can build to a place where one day when we are restored back to the garden, we'll be in that position. It's not for now. So, Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So, the picture is, is that um, they were washing themselves and preparing themselves for two days. They came through from Egypt, went through the wonder of the sea parting. They saw an army that had the full might of destroying them, being destroyed in front of their eyes. They had the water freshened in Marah. They ate every morning of the manna. They 
obliterated Amalek without being trained in warfare because of what the Father has done. Now they are standing. They got out of their tents and they're moving closer. And they're standing at the foot of the mountain. And it says, And Mount Sinai was in smoke, all of it, because Yotevafe descended upon it in fire. And its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace. And you know what? We can read these words. We can just read through these words and think, Oh, wonderful. Get a picture in your mind of what it means. Remember, this is a wedding festival. The Father is preparing to introduce the words of engaging into a relationship with these people. And says, And the smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain trembled exceedingly. A huge earthquake started to happen. It says in Psalm 29 that the animals gave birth spontaneously, the oaks, the cedars were broken, every syllable the, the, that the Father spoke, the earth, the stones were bouncing all over, and the earth just vibrated, river responded to the words that the Father has spoken. He didn't speak English, that's why I can't get it out. So, but I don't know if we know what this means. I know it's a, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 draws on this. Let me just show you. I haven't got it with me. I thought I had. I didn't. I don't. But it's here somewhere. And it is in the New Testament. And it says, For with a shout of command, with the archangel's call, and with the loud sound of our father's trumpet, Yotevave himself will come down from heaven, and the dead who belong in Messiah will rise first. What is the picture? On what does, does this draw? Where does this come from? It's this story. What will our response be? Apparently that's in our future sometime. What will our response be when that's happening? So, I want to play you something, just as a... I've got something here. Now, I don't think this music was written when this happened, so don't... But anyways, this is what was happening. I don't know if Mendelssohn was around then. But if that is the interpretation of what the Father had in mind, with his loud trumpet, because remember they were invited when the tr trumpet sounded long. What should they have done? What were they meant to do? Come nearer. That's what they were meant to do. That's why the Father spends the whole half last half of chapter 19 and saying to Moses coming up the mountain going down up and mountain going down saying let build a boundary around the mountain make sure they don't approach beyond the boundary but they must approach me to hear my voice and stand in my presence that's what he was saying and when the blast of the ram's horn sounded long and became louder and louder we heard did you hear Moshe spoke and Elohim answered him by voice what did Moses say? What would you have said? What would you say? The mountain is quaking, the stones are rolling, the animals are responding, the people are trembling. What would you say to the living Elohim? Whatever you say, choose your words nicely. So, Maybe we would say, come, Yote Vafe. And, you know, we sing these songs, stand in our midst, you know. I doubt really we have got a full idea and picture of what it means. So, the problem is with what happened is, and all the people saw the thunders and the lightning flashes and the sound of the ram's horn and the mountains smoking, and the people saw it and they trembled. 
and stood at a distance. So what will this wedding ceremony look like if the bridegroom presents himself and the bride turns around? The organ is playing, Mendelssohn in all his glory, and the bride turns around and walks away. The minister is left at the pulpit, and they say to him, you interpret our father's voice and give it to us. So, verse 19, and he said to Moses, you speak with us and we hear, but let not Elohim speak with us lest we die. And Moshe said to the people, do not fear, for Elohim has come to test you in order, just this one point here, in order that you fear these, Yireh Adonai will be put before you, that you will know his awe and his splendor and his might, so that when you walk away from here, from this mountain, this is what will be in your mind, so that when you approach your enemy, difficulties of life, things that challenge you, this is what's in your life and your heart, the goodness and the grace and the mercy of our Father, his awesomeness. His fear will be within you so that you do not sin. So the people stood at a distance. But Moshe drew near. He drew near. So this is what our calling was. This is what Israel's calling was, is to draw near. In the thick darkness where Elohim was. Do you see that Elohim never presents an image of himself here? Never. He comes in darkness and thunder and lightning with a loud voice. That's how he presents himself. So that we cannot make an image of who he is. It is for our benefit, for our purposes. So our Father speaks these words. Remember chapter 20 is the words that he spoke. Chapter, all of chapter 19, he was preparing them for, the, for receiving the words. Chapter 20, the words was given. And then in chapter 20, verse 8, it says, And the people st uh, stood at a distance. So what he's calling in our lives is, is to, is to live out his character and to bear his image. So that we can be a reflection of him, of his son. That's what he's telling us in the Brit Kharisha, in the Apostolic Scriptures. He's saying, we are, our calling is to resemble, to be a resemblance of the son. So in what regards? In worshipping of our father, treating one another and restoring our identity as a son and a daughter, living as an icon. That little thing that you see on your computer screen, what happens if you click on it? The program opens. So what happens with you if you are clicked? You're driving down in traffic, and somebody double clicks you. What program initiates? What happens? Is it the image of the father that comes out? Is that, the, is that what happens? Or is it a trap? Who is the one? Yeah, good question. I'm glad we asked it. So, so restoration of the blessing is what our Father has got in mind. If we want to be the, the, the Eden story, if we want to be fruitful and multiply, as Adam is told, rule and reign, we must know what it is, what it looks like from the Father's perspective. If we don't, we will fail in every regard. The Father is going to instruct us on in what He looks like, what His values, character is like. And if we can live according to those set principles, we will be successful in applying His word and values and principles in our lives. And when our icon is double-clicked, the Father will open and His glory will be shown to the one that stands in opposition to you. Not for the reason of judgment or anything else, but so that people can see the goodness and the mercy of our Father. Remember Exodus 34, 6? It's Yahweh, Yahweh, al rahum Vechanun, Varav, Chesed, Ve. It is, our Father is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love and in truth, showing mercy to thousands. If you are double-clicked in traffic, that's what needs to open up. So... The ten words begin in faith. I am the one. 
who brought you out of Egypt. And it ends with contentment, with gratefulness. That's the way. That is the way that we live in the Father's presence. As we stand in faith before Him and we live in gratefulness. If we do anything else, we're going through the wrong door. Exodus 20 verse 20 says, I am Yotevafa, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. It's a restoration of our identity, the one that we follow, know who is the one that we are bowing for, who is the one that we worship. Remember we sang this morning, we worship you. This is the one that we are worshiping, the one who is our redeemer and our deliverer. The one who our characters need to be transformed into. That's the first one. The second one is, you have no other mighty ones before my face. And the heart soul story of that is, is every time that idolatry in Israel, or not every time, most of the times that idolatry in Israel took place, where did they place the idols? What did they do with them? They took him into the temple courts. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Do not bring them close to me. Because I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I delivered you. You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above and the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. All three realms. The heavens above. What would a carved image of the heavens above look like? What would we resemble? What would we carve an image of? The astronomical elements, the stars, the moons, the everything else. That's what we would like. Because they are the, an image to these people. They were the images of the authorities of the heavens that were placed over us. But they are created, part of the creation. Do not make for yourself a carved image. Why not a carved image? Because you will bow down to creation. The Father already has an image of what... He wanted to show the world what it looks like. It's you and I. So if you bow down to something that's created, you are lessening your experience. You're not bearing the image that you are supposed to bear because we are bearing the image of the Father. And it doesn't matter in which one of those realms it is because we are to rule over those realms, not them ruling over us. We are to rule and reign. You do not bow down to them or serve them, for I am Yotevafa, your Elohim. I am a jealous. Elkanah is the word. Visiting the crookedness of the fathers and the children in the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commandments. I, I heard this morning when we read it, it is, it says, I must just find it. For I am Adonai visiting the crookedness. Visiting the crookedness. If you look in the King James and if you look in some of the translations, even what we read this morning, it says, punishing the crookedness. The word's punishing. Have you read it? Have you seen it? That's what, uh, that's what the translation says. But the word is pakad. The word there is pakad. And the first time that we see pakad is in when, when um, Sarah received Isaac, her father visited her. Her father remembered her and Isaac was conceived. That is Pakad. This is about the only place in scripture where Pakad is used as punishment sometimes, translated, because that's our expectation. The Ten Commandments is a list of words that we need to act appropriately on and then the father will be happy with us. That's not the heart. It is visiting, that is visiting the crookedness of the fathers, so that the people in the third and fourth generations can be restored back into my presence. It's not pushing away, it's restoration. You do not bring the name of your father to nothing. Do not take his name in vain, most scripture says. For Adonai does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to nothing. Actually, that let's just dwell on that uh, verse a little bit. It says, Lo tisa, lo tisa, you will not take up et shem yotevafe elohecha. Uh, what, what's that? Lashav. 
you will not take up. That word tisa, where is it now? I saw it there. Is it there? Yeah, there it is. Lo tisa comes from the what Hebrew word? What's the root word there? Who knows? It's the word nasa. It's the word nasa. We see it in America. Where do they go? They take up stuff into the heavenlies. So this is the same principle. As you will not bear, you will not lift up. You will not live out your purpose as an image bearer of the Father. Carry His character, resembling His character, in a way that will lead to futility, to nothing. Nasa is to lift, to bring forth. Shav is to ruin morally, make it useless or make it false. Now most scriptures say, do not pronounce his name wrongfully. It is not in the pronunciation where the problem is. Because Yotevave is an unknown pronunciation. We can, we've got impressions, we've got opinions, we've got various ways. That's not the, that is not the primary problem. Shem is to do with his character. We shall not, as a image bearer, represent him in a way that will lead his character to fertility, to make it false. That one is the problem. Oh, here it is. Let me just go back there. You shall not take the name of Adonai in vain. You see it? Take the name in vain, we mean mostly swearing. You will swear in our Father's name. In Afrikaans sê dit, jy mag die naam van ons vader nie eidelik gebruik nie. Eidelik gebruik is die, die indruk wat het by ons los, en is miskien ons achtergrond sê, die manier wat jy sy naam uitspreek mag nie verkeerd wees nie. Want, want as jy sy naam verkeerdelik gebruik, dan maak jy hom minder. Dit is reg, dit is so, ek stem naam jy saam. But the primary use and purpose for this is to represent him as an image bearer, his character falsely. That's the main purpose of this story. So, 20 verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. So what was most prominent in their minds, in the minds of Israel? Their recent history. They just came out of Egypt, remember? When did they come out of Egypt? What was the date? Started on the redemption, took place the 14th of Aviv. The redemption, and when they moved out, they were delivered the 15th, and then it culminates in the days of unlimited bread up to the seventh day, which is a Shabbat. It's a beautiful week given for us. So for them, it's a festival of deliverance, of overcoming, of being set free from the enemy. But when was the first time that this happened? After the days where our father worked for six days and he rested on the seventh day. What will be the last, not the last, but what will be a future occurrence of this day? In the seventh day of creation, well, the seventh millennium will be a million millennium, a day of rest that we spend in our Father's presence and in the kingdom. So if we are remembering the Shabbat, we as a community act together in glorifying our Father's name, living out those ideas, ideals. This is why we do it. Because we are not our own providers. We work for six days, and we work hard. You should. That's part of keeping Shabbat, by the way. Keeping Shabbat is working for six days, and resting on the seventh day. That is what Shabbat is about. If you don't do the one, you can't do the other. Sort of a deal. You must be active. And you haven't got a full-time job. Baruch Hashem, you can work in the community. You can do something else with your life that adds value to the kingdom. So that's what we are doing. So, if we are resting on the seventh day, we are saying, all the pressures that's in my life can hold for one day and give glory to the Father, because He is my provider. The rest of the week, we can go for it again. Six days you labor, and you shall do all your work, and the seventh day is the Shabbat of your Teva, for your Elohim, and you do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger, which is in your gates. Everybody. How many are there? Uh, you didn't, it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, all of us. Everybody. The fullness of the expression is we are showing the rest that we are entering 
and to the Father. For in six days our Father made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, and the rested in the seventh day. And therefore, as He has rested and set it apart, so shall we. 20 verse 12 says, Respect your father and your mother so that your days are prolonged on the soil. And that's the one with the promise. It is as representatives of our father. If everything went well and life was perfect, our father created Adam and Chava in whose image? In his image. What does Genesis 5, I think verse 1 say? When Adam had a son, in whose image was the son created? In the image of Adam. It says he had the son, I think it was Seth, in the image of Adam. My sons and daughters, your, you, our sons and daughters are created in our image. How does your image represent the father and where does it lead them? That's our responsibility as parents. Is if we have children, we lead them in the image of, our fo- of my life, in the image of our forefathers, and ultimately the image of Yote Vafe. That's our responsibility. And this is why we respect them. It's because the Father has placed our mothers and fathers in our lives as co-creators. If it wasn't for them, who didn't have a mother or a father here? Most of us do, I think. We should. And we should honor them because the Father has used them to bring us forth. That's how it works, apparently. You do not murder. Why don't don't we murder? What is the story with murder? What is the proclamation if we murder someone? What do we proclaim? We have got the authority of death and life. I decide who lives and who dies. That is the proclamation if we murder. So, a father says, he's the one that's got the authority over life and death. That's why we don't murder. We don't commit adultery because if this is a community that lives in each other's relationships and tightly knitted as we had in the days gone by and hopefully in days in the future, if somebody here is involved in adultery, it will break this community apart because the relationships in this community will be severely affected. And, and the image... And the idea of the image bearing of all parties concerned will be destroyed. That's why we uphold the sanctity of the marriage, because that's the image of what the Father and Israel is going into. We do not steal because the Father says, a blessing on your life is to rule and reign over the area that you've been appointed. And if I come and take some of the ruling and reigning away from Om Christu, then what happens is I undermine the authority and the blessing that the Father has put in his life, and I undermine my image, my experience as the image bearer, and this community suffers. Because remember, we start off in Pesach as individuals before the Father, but we are growing into a community expression where in Yom Kippur we stand before the Father and we can say, Israel together as a nation stand before the throne. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16 will, will play himself out. So do not bear false witnesses against your neighbor. What will, do this, what will this do in a community? Because remember, this is sort of uh, judicial language. That's the right term. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. When do we bear a witness? In, in which, what, okay, what sort of an environment? Yeah, so we are, we are going into this community, something has happened, and we are called into this venue. And I'm saying, there's a, there is, someone said against this brother, something is said against this brother or sister of mine. Is there any witnesses to this case? So if someone stands up and bear a false witness, and other people know it to be false, what will happen to us? We must speak the truth, because if you're an image bearer of our Father, He says, is rich in love and in truth. That's who we are. And then the last one, 20 verse 17, you do not covet your neighbor's house. Seven things, look at it. His house, his wife, his servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, and whatever. 
It's the wholeness, the fullness that's expressed of our experience to our neighbors. And why don't we do it? How do we manage your desires? Okay, let's start there. So you have got a broken down car, battling with a car. And I um, work at someone's house, or I see my neighbor driving up with a brand new car. So what do I do? Do I say, oh, thank you, Father, that you provided for him, and I move on in my life? Or do I think, whew, that will solve a lot of my problems? I don't know. So that's a de- is that a legitimate desire, or is that something that you... Ex- I don't know. Anyone have some desires like that? Anyone? I know this is a difficult subject because we can put hands up and pray for one another afterwards. But, but it's every one of us, that's how we grow in our exposure to life. If you were living out on a farm and you didn't know better and you come into town and you suddenly see the things that life gives, you will have a desire to develop in that direction. And I don't think that's a huge problem. That shouldn't be a problem. But what do we do with that desire? That is the story. Because if I desire something that my neighbor has to the extent that it overpowers me and put me in a position that I'm discontent with what the Father has put in my life, then it becomes a problem. So contentment is where we are going to. Gratitude and contentment. That's that's our experience. So when it says, do not covet, it asks us, to be responsible with the things that we see around us. Be responsible in the way that you perceive life so that life will not overpower you and drive you down a road where it becomes a trap. Because it's these things that present traps in our lives. So it's more effective to cultivate our desires in what we read and listen to if we do the things that is good rather than the things that is not so good. So the way that we live our lives and our expression is to encourage one another in this way that we live and appreciate what the Father has put in other people's lives and we bless our Father for the provision in our lives and be content in our dependency on Him. Because it doesn't matter if my neighbor drives a better car than what I do. There is a certain responsibility that he has that I share. I've got a car, he's got a car. Responsibilities. So gratitude is the key not to covet. And this is a challenge for me and for everyone around us. That's how much gratitude. Look at the things that we have in our lives, each one of us, whether it be little or whether it be a lot. Write this, there was a suggestion this morning, Andre said, write down the things that, we, that the Father has placed in our lives. If you feel down... Depressed? Yeah, let's stop at depressed. It's a good place to stop. If you are in that place where you are battling to survive and you feel overwhelmed by the things that the world throws at you, start here. Write the things that the Father has given you down in your life so that when you are in a difficult place, you can be reminded of His provision and blessing so that we can focus on the goodness and the provision of our Father. Because we can so easily focus on the one thing that we don't have and forget about the 20 things that He has placed in our lives. And then when we are discontented and we are not, we don't show gratitude, we are in a difficult place. So, it becomes easier as we trust the character of our Father. How will we trust our Father more? How do we do it? How do we trust our Father more and more and more and more until we fully trust Him? To develop a relationship with Him through prayer, through worship, and studying of His Word. But that is, those things are all sort of, it can be passive, you know? It can be all inward focused and passive. But remember, we are called to live the things that we have done here, live it out in the community that we find here so that we can become a conduit of the heart of the Father, to show His love and His mercy and His grace to one another. And as we do that, we are empowered so that more of it can start to flow, and we see His work in our midst. And I think that's about it. 
Any comments? Anything? Uh, ten second comments because I see everybody is doing this. I don't know what's going on. So, anything? We start our life in faith and we end in content and gratitude. Yes, where is a mic? Can we just have a mic from Christy, please? Christy, just uh, wait for the mic, please. Otherwise, nobody's going to hear. The ten words are, the the first is what you should do, and the last five is what you should not do. Yeah. So the first, the ones that you should do is because you love God. And the ones you don't do is because you respect Him. Yeah. So, honor, respect, and love is the foundation stone of what this all is about. Father, we thank you for the privilege of sharing your word with one another. I'm reminded of Jeremiah 31 that says, we'll come at a stage, we'll come at a time in our experience where we will not teach one another your word because we will all know you. So Father, as we are growing in our knowledge of who you are and our expression of who you are, help us to search for your heart and to live out your compassion and your love and your mercy and your truth in one another's presence so that we can encourage one another and that we can be fully reconciled with you in every aspect of our lives. We thank you, Father, for this day, this lovely hot day that you've given us, that we can celebrate your goodness and we know your plans for us are good. And as we are walking forward as a fellowship We trust in you. We trust fully, Father, that you will lead us into the place where you have purposed us to be and help us, empower us to hear your voice so that we can love you and obey you and above all, cling to you in everything that we do. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that indwells us and your word that you have deposited in our lives. Help us and guide us in the name of Yeshua. Amen.